Um, or now I'm Dr. Enderbitson. Scary thought. Um, I am a autistic mental health clinician. I'm, I'm a licensed clinical social worker here in Wisconsin. I do research with Mayo Clinic Health System on improving access to pediatric care. I'm writing a book for Norton on polyvagal theory of autism. And today I'm here to talk to you about the Autism Symposium 2023 coming up next week. Um, if you just take a snapshot of that thing right in the corner here, right? Um, if you just hold your phone up, snap it, it'll bring you right to www.pesi.com slash ASD23. Um, and so I'm going to talk to us a little bit today about um, autism and internal family systems therapy and kind of why IFS. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's not traditionally thought of as something we talk about in therapy with people with autism specifically more how do we work with their trauma so my background is i'm a level two sensory motor psychotherapist and i right have trauma and so i'm gonna tell some stories from my trauma um so trigger warning right like some of these could be pretty intense um but what i'd like to do is share that and sort of share my experience going through ifs um, because it's been magical. It really has. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what is IFS um, in this next 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to talk about my own experience. Um, and then we're going to talk about how this applies to autism and why I use it with people with autism. And hopefully you'll come to the Autism Symposium 23. Again, register right in the corner. Um, so I recently went to a John Mayer concert at the Excel Energy Center, and it was spectacular. Um, Joy Alakudan was the opening act, and she was just fantastic. And so the Excel Energy Center, it's big, it's U-shaped, right? And so there's like 10, 15,000 seats in it. And lo and behold, right, like I go... So the last time I had been there was about two, three years ago. Um, actually, it's probably three or four years by now. And I saw the chain smokers with my ex, at, who at the time I was um, engaged to be married to. And so when we went to see chain smokers, we sat up in the left hand corner. And so I didn't consciously do this. But when I arrived at the John Mayer concert a couple of weeks ago, um, when he was there, I I was sort of alarmed because I was like, why am I in these same seats? Like it really got intense, right? Like there were some suicidal ideations. There was like, oh, I could just jump from here. And it was really intense. And what was really like, I've done enough work with my therapist to know, oh, I'm having a trigger. I'm having a flashback, right? And so my parts, right? Like the lesser than conscious parts of me decided that we were going to choose the same seats. I don't think it was a coincidence. I can tell you for a fact that I didn't consciously go, I'm choosing here. Like I just kind of had a list and I just went click. And, but some part of me, right? Like had this sort of notion that it would be a good idea to choose the same spot because this part of me feels like I deserve suicide. I deserve to feel this pain. I deserve all the hurt from being left, which, you know, isn't actually true, which is wonderful about it, right? But in the moment, right, like our brain and our amygdala doesn't know that. So our amygdala, right, like is the, <clears throat> it's kind of like a dog, right? It barks at a mailman, it barks at a burglar, right? Like not very good at telling the difference between the two and, right? So because that's the case, like in that moment when I was in those seats, right, those intense urges to die, Right. Because this part of me feels like this, this protector or maybe exile feels like, right. That Sean, you're what life isn't worth living. Like you deserve everything that came your way. And so that's the thing about parts, right? Like parts, they're super well intended. Like this part of me is probably a part of me that holds a lot of pain. I would refer to this part as a protector, right? Like it was protecting me from in its eyes, right, like existence as painful as this is, right, like existing is painful. And so this part of me, this less than conscious protector, right, really, really, really needed 
some space to be like upset and it just needed to be named, which is what happened. So when we think about IFS, right, we're really thinking about those parts. Um, kind of like I had that protector who wanted to throw me off from this flight of stairs, right? They're less than conscious parts that put us in these places that we might not consciously choose otherwise. And so we have protectors driving our actions. We have managers, right? Managers are parts that like to distract us from pain. So they can be like addiction. So think like alcohol addiction, weed addiction, methamphetamine addiction, et cetera, et cetera. It can be, I'm going to stay really busy, right? Like and work in lots of ways. And, and addiction or managers, right, are really trying to manage that pain, manage that agony <clears throat> um, in a way that allows our exile parts, right, these less than conscious parts that hold all our hurt from childhood, like in a way that like really brings it back home, right, like they... So they're they're trying to be protected because in the ex in the manager parts and the protector parts eyes, the exile, the child, the inner child, right? Your inner autistic child, if you're autistic and you're watching this, right? It doesn't think that part can handle it. Now the crazy thing is the understanding of these parts is probably pretty rooted in when these things happen, right? Like this part of me that wanted to throw me off this building, right? Like it it probably was rooted in when my ex left, right? She said, you know, you're ugly, you're, you're not attractive, right? So I'm leaving. Like, <laughs> and so like this part of me holds that, it's like, this is my fault, right? Like, it's my fault that blah, 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 that she left, that we're not at this John Mayer concert together. And so when I think about clients that I work with, with autism and trauma, I think a lot about, well, what are the less than conscious forces shaping their actions? What are the parts that sort of intersect? And so there's a fair amount of evidence for internal family systems therapy. Um, and IFS is sort of the spectrum, right? Like it was not initially designed for people with dissociative identity disorder, but a lot of times it gets applied in those situations where there's really complex trauma and there's these parts of us, right, that really open um, open us up and really run the show in some ways we might not consciously choose. And so what I find so fascinating about IFS is that it really works well with my autistic clients. My autistic clients are super rational, right? I don't know if you've ever seen like the show Silicon Valley or heard the joke that, well, Silicon Valley, biggest place for people with autism. But my clients are kind of like that. Um, a lot of times when they come and they're present, they really are, how do I say this? They are, they're really like thinkers. Like they do brilliant and amazing things. Like I sat across from a seven-year-old one day and they could like put together a car engine. Like I'm 33, still can't do that. <laughs> like it's just some hard stuff. Right. So like their brains, right? Like they are just super rational. So those feeling parts, right, can sometimes be really overwhelming to bring up to them when they have trauma. Right. So when someone with autism has been raped or when someone with autism has witnessed someone commit suicide or witnessed community violence or been subject to racial violence. Right. Like it's not exactly easy to unpack because there's sort of this dynamic of I'm not going to like I'm not going to come close to those feelings because they're going to be overwhelming. Um, some of my autistic patients often will say, I feel more and am more sensitive than most of the neurotypical peers that I have. And so it's really kind of profound when they come in with these wounds and these agony. And so if you come to my talk, right? Like I will walk you through, how do you work with this rational part? Because really it's about like meeting your client where they are at, with them in the moment, right? And really beginning to draw out like a well, if we think about a well, right? Like, and we draw up, we draw up that pain, we have to do it in a way that's sort of tiered. And so it can be a little, a little much to just go straight at it, like TFCBT might. Um, <clears throat> but what is helpful, right? 
is to really begin able to begin to contact people and their bodies and allow that body to tell the story, right? Because when words are not enough, as Pat Ogden would say, like the body tells us a lot. And so we contact the body. Um, and so if we contact the body, right, we can begin to bring up these stories. We have to do it in a way that's slow enough, right? Because we're drawing the water up gently. Um, if we draw it up too fast, right? Like oftentimes what I find in my research when I'm working with sensory motor psychotherapists on with patients with autism in the research we do through Tulane, um, it sort of bounces, right? Like it, it's like they throw it, like they make the context statement and boom, like it just does not like click. It's like they get distracted, they go somewhere else. And so one of the things we've been encountering it during in the research, which I'll talk about in my talk, which I hope you'll come to, um, again, register right, right here. Um, um, one of the things I'll cover is how do you begin to really like slowly draw that emotion up? I think if you want a really great takeaway and this is all you watch, think about sort of cognitively approaching emotions, right? Like what is sadness? Like, how do we define sadness? And that might seem silly, but it's really important because these, these are rational problems, right? Like if we try and throw somebody in all at once to, to some of these experiences, right? Like it's too much. And so if it's too much, we have to sort of like regroup. And so one of the things I'd encourage you to do is begin, right, with the body, but begin with emotions cognitively, even before you begin to explore them in the body. Um, the body is sort of where we draw things up from, but we have to be sure our clients can really like tolerate being in their body. And so to do that, we really need to sort of cognitively, so cognition, right, is one of these parts. Like I've been talking about earlier, like the part of me that wanted to throw me off the balcony from John Mayer. Right. So like this part, right. It, it's super rational. It's super like, you got to break it down for it. Because if I started, like when I felt that agony and that despair, right. Like this, you deserve this, Sean, like that guilt, like that was too much. Like the only way I got through that was by connecting with friends. Right. And like texting them and saying, Hey, life's good. Like, what's up? <laughs> like, let's talk because John Mayer is an incredible guitarist, but like this part of me, right, really felt like I deserved it. And so really connecting to social relationship, right, like was a super great strategy to begin to tolerate that stress, right? And so if I'm working with somebody, so for somebody outside who's not me, right, one of my autistic clients with trauma, again, it's about really like beginning to rationally put their head around like, who am I? Because really that's the question we're trying to answer because as Jay Early would say, um, we're kind of on a march towards wholeness. And so, I mean, when we do IFS with people, really like that's the goal is how do we become whole? How do we, like how Sean can you be with this part of you that wants to die and really feels guilty for all the reasons your ex left you, right? The uh, Even though she was the one who was cheating, right? Like, it doesn't, like no amount of explaining and justifying really lets me feel and tolerate the feeling of guilt that is totally connected. And, and so what I'm, I'm getting at, right, is that this is what we do with IFS. We begin to journey towards wholeness. And so in my talk, we cover what IFS is, we cover polyvagal theory. We talk a little bit about Deb Dana and somatic awareness. Um, as it relates to polyvagal theory, because I think about autism in states, um, and that's sort of a whole discussion to itself. And so I cover a lot of this stuff, and then I even break it down further into some exercises you can do with clients. Um, thank you, Alexis. Um, but this has been great, guys. I hope you're enjoying. Um, so really, consider registering. It's going to be a great time. Um, you're going to hear from Temple Grandin and Stephen Porges. Um, we've had some really great names in the past, like Barry Prezant. Um, and so I'm hoping this was helpful for you guys. So, yeah, that's all I got.